the Diddy stories. The Diddy story has been around, right? Mm-hmm. But now it's coming forward because Cassie filed the lawsuit. And mm-hmm. I guess that gave more people courage to like, like, all right, I'm putting out a lawsuit. And it's not just famous people that have Diddy stories. I've heard Diddy stories from regular people. So you hear those mm-hmm. stories from all sides and now they're coming out. And the thing is, people have been afraid because this is a capitalist society. You still got to work. Don't nobody want to be homeless, right? And so mm-hmm. you might, you might just not say anything because... It always falls on you. Like the people with the power, even if they're awful people, they're always the one that that are given, they're given some kind of grace. Like, grace. oh, you shouldn't have said mm-hmm. that about them. We, mm-hmm. we still want them to come to the parties because they still pull the purse strings or they still have influence. Hey, my name is Queen. Welcome to the Mix Vixen channel. If you are new here, hey boo. And if you are not new here, thanks for coming through again. I appreciate you. You see from the title what we're talking about. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because I have always been a media junkie. From magazines, new papers, entertainment shows, I was on it. My views and ideas on journalistic media as a child and teenager obviously have changed. And I've grown to see that media specifically journalism is far more political than I thought so in my youth and that's obviously why I have this channel that's obviously why I've had a podcast for so long and also why I started writing the standards I have for media have changed as my knowledge of the systems that we live in grew media is powerful so as I witness social media become a very unregulated information source it gets a little scary. Print media is currently in the ICU. Digital journalism platforms are laying off most of their staff. Black platforms like The Breakfast Club or Joe Budden Podcast are platforming people like Candace Owens. And I'm seeing ridiculous op-eds written about people's like ability, written about whether people are getting brand deals. When there is an actual live takedown of Diddy happening and no one is reporting on it. All of that made me wonder if black media is in a crisis and if so, how did we get here and how do we get out of it? I obviously have so many thoughts and wanted to explore so much. So this video will be a community conversation. I asked Star Rock, who is a journalist, cultural critic and podcaster to join me for this conversation because I have many opinions, but I wanted to bring someone more versed in the industry of journalism and media from inside info on horrible work practices as some of your fave pubs to the relationship hip hop and other black media have with each other and how that has harmed women and hip hop and uh, so much more so 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 much more but obviously before that let me get into today's video sponsor i would like to thank today's sponsor my ride or die mix fixing patreon members become a patron for as low as two dollars a month to help sustain this platform and get exclusive content or if you don't want another subscription because you know we got millions of those at this point and still want to donate hit me up on a cash app on a venmo i actually had someone send me a donation on venmo so i want to say thank you aaron i see you i appreciate you and if you can't do either of those that is fine just comment or leave a thumbs up on this video because that's free and i love those too oh so i wanted to have a community conversation about the crisis that i believe is happening in media and obviously highlight what's going on in black media because you know talk about black shit and as a media junkie i've always been a media junkie a huge consumer of magazines magazine like shows like that's just always been my thing it's just kind of interesting to see like print media be like basically in the icu to see digital journalism just be ripped apart we've seen all of these layoffs happening and stuff like that and you know i have many opinions on like what is happening why is it happening how would you describe the state of media and then i guess you know narrow it down to black media in this moment Oh, it's dismal. It's in a dismal place. Um, (laughs) It's in a terrible, terrible place. Like you, I grew up being a media junkie. I loved watching like news. I was like nine years old watching like 60 Minutes and and shows like that. And I read a lot. I would pick up 
my mom read a lot. My, you know, I come from people who read a lot. So I would pick up a newspaper and just be reading it. And so I also was a media junkie. Um, and that kind of inspired me to want to go into journalism, like the concept of storytelling, the idea of it. And I always went back and forth because I was a theater kid. So it was Mm -hmm. that. And then the journalism. And then by the time I got to like high school, you know, the the source magazine was out and like um, vibe was out. And so I was like, oh, so I can combine like music, art and entertainment with my love of storytelling. And I just knew I was going to be this journalist, like, like an Aaliyah S. King or like a Joan mm-hmm. Morgan, like these people that I looked at. And I mean, I say this, this day, I feel like media has always probably been controversial. Cause like, if you, you know, if you study the history of it, there's, there have always been periods of, of, of media being used for sensationalism. But I think now it's just all integrity is out the window. Like, mm-hmm. I, first of all, I had the nerve to go to college for media like the <laughs> nerve, degree, the nerve. <laughs> Please, I learned quickly. You don't even really need that. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. you do. The, like things that I learned in college made me a more valuable journal. Well, maybe valuable is not the right word, but a more competitive journalist. Or like, mm-hmm. um, like for example, you know, we had to study the history of media, and then I went to an HBCU, so then it was like media and Black images and how Black yeah. people are portrayed, classes like that. And we had to study the First Amendment, like the full thing, not just, I can say anything I want because free speech, but like the actual ins and outs of it and how speech can be dangerous and speech can be used as a weapon. We had to take like philosophy classes. We had to take um, psychology classes, like to learn how to think and to learn how the way people tell stories is mm-hmm. very, um, it's different. Like, Three people could have seen the same thing happen. And those three people will have a different perspective on what happened. And so now it's or, or a different recanting of what happened. And so now it's you as the journalist. You're the one that's responsible for how do you tell this story in the most fair and balanced and accurate way? And yeah. I think what happens now is you get bloggers in the mix. You get everyday people with an opinion in the mix. And they're just, well, it happened like this and that's that that's the only side of the story because that's the side of the story that I care about. And so it's, yeah, journalism has gone off the rails. And I started to see like early in my career that um, it was falling apart because I started like Mm -hmm. early aughts, like in in magazines. And actually I I started writing for websites. Like print magazines? Like print magazines. So, Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I started for writing for websites first. This is what happened. So I started right. writing for like allhiphop.com, hiphop DX, all those stuff like that. But at that time, this was probably like 2006, 2007. I was like, I still want to work at a magazine. Like I still have to work at a magazine if I'm going to be a real journalist. Got and it. I knew mm-hmm. get my first job interview with a magazine was um, XXL Magazine. And the publisher at that time, a white man, he saw my mm-hmm. clips from the, the the internet sites that I was writing for. And he was like, oh, so you came to get a real job, right? So it went from, they didn't understand digital to now, uh-huh. to the end of my time there, it was like, oh, we got to make more of a digital shift. We got to get more into social media. And they were having blogger networks and they were like looking at bloggers as kind of like, these are the beacons of information now. So I started to see that early on that that's what was starting to happen. Okay. And now it's just, it, it's just completely tipped the other way. Like this is a blogger's market. Media is a blogger's game. It is. What would you say is the difference between a blogger and a journalist? We hear that joke all the time. You know, that's just a blogger. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it always seems to be this beef. Like I hear bloggers now talking about, well, journalists are just jealous that we make more money and da, 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 da. And it's like, I would rather have integrity. Right. And mm-hmm. like. Let me just say, not all bloggers are bad, but a lot of the ones that get propped up are harmful. But Mm -hmm. the difference between a blogger and a journalist, a journalist can be a blogger and a blogger can be a journalist if they take the right precautions. There are things you need to learn. As much as I, I, I said earlier, like I had the nerve to get a journalism degree. What I'll say about that is there is there is stuff to learn as a journalist. So, yes, bloggers and journalists are different. 
journalists are going to take nuance into account and yeah. they're going to make sure they tell the story as, as accurately as possible. Um, if you're, if you're a traditional journalist, you're keeping yourself out of it. You're keeping it fair and balanced. You have to reach out to both sides, not in a way that's harmful. I feel like what's happening now is this both sidesism is not taking nuance into yes. account. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, so, um, that's kind of like what we're seeing with the breakfast club and stuff like that. Yes. Okay. All these, these people that are like bringing Candace Owens in, like, well, we have to speak to the other side, really. Like, did you did you really think about how the, the harmful things she has said in the past and the fact that I'll, I'll tell you this, T, and I mm-hmm. tweeted you this. There was a joke uh, recently because Candace Owens people just went on this like this black media blitz. And like they all of a sudden just started pitching all these black media outlets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we used to we were laughing like. You know, me and my colleagues, at least, were, like, laughing about it, like, okay, no, this is not happening. But people took the bait. But, yes. so to answer your question, a journalist is going to think about that, think about the harm they could cause with their platform. And even, there is a such thing as opinion journalism. Opinion journalism still needs to be well-researched and thought out. Like, it can't just be going off of feelings or, or this is going to get the people going, so this is what I'm going to say. Bloggers, on the other hand, they're not fully beholden to... I guess, some of the rules and ethics of journalism. Anybody could be a blogger. Anybody Mm -hmm. can put whatever they want out there. And that's what bloggers are, people with an opinion who create a platform for it. And I do like, though, that now you're starting to see more people try to hold bloggers accountable, like with the Cardi B, Tasha K um, debacle, because that was crazy. That's the that's a journalistic nightmare. Like, yeah, I'm pretty sure if a- anyone in journalism school now, especially if you went to an HBCU, they're probably studying that case as a mm-hmm. super WTF, what not to do in mm-hmm. terms of First Amendment, like breakdown and how you can use your platform for harm. So, but yeah, journalists and bloggers are different. They can be one and the same. I've found myself many a times being more of a blogger than a journalist. I mean, mm-hmm. at magazines, there were times where maybe someone from the top down mandated that all the writers on staff have to now have a blog. So, mm, okay. yeah. So it's, well, it's, why were they, why? Like what was the incentive of, of doing that? Bloggers were on trend. So okay. the, the very first time it happened for me, it was at double XL and um, they just thought blogging was so cool. Like, mm. you know, Oh, look at, look at two dope boys. This was in the era of like the two dope boys and, um, Nicole bitches were starting to come up uh-huh, and like all okay. the hip hop blogs and stuff. And all those people, there's no middleman, right? Like they get more attention. They, you start to have celebrities leaking things to them. Yeah. They're breaking news and they're like, they're, they're the new hot it thing. And so magazines were looking at that and were like, Oh, we need that because we want that kind of traffic. And that all ties back to money, right? Because right. now, because some of these blogs are blowing up, sales teams are competing for the very little funds that already exist anyway, especially for black media. So mm-hmm. it was that thing of, yeah, you guys have to have a blog now. So now that's our way of being able to shirk the journalist, the journalistic integrity. And now we can say what we want. We can talk off the cuff. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And so that that's what that was about basically. So now we have, you know, the bloggers, the journalists. Do you think that we are now getting more of our information and news from like the blogosphere? That's where it's leaning to. And I think it's incredibly harmful that a lot of our information is coming from opinion based, biased Mm -hmm. blog spaces. How do you think we shift that? Like what, what, what do we do? I think we're far gone. Honestly, I Mm. think (laughs) I hate to sound like such a cynic. It's it's terrible. (laughs) Like, and I don't even know if blogosphere is the right word. Like, unless uh-huh. like, you mean social media too. Social like, media, like, like, yeah, yeah so like, okay, for that. So the podcasters, say, like everyone yeah, who yeah, has, okay. who is using you're their right. voice to, yes, that's what I mean, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you're right. So we could, yeah, bloggersphere. Just want to clarify. Yeah, we're gone. I, like, I honestly believe society's destruction is, ironically, information. There's all this information, and yet people still don't know shit. People still haven't learned how to think. And how to be, and I hate to say critical thinking because I feel like that's become a new po- poster phrase for stupid, right? Yes. Like people that I'm a critical thinker, and like, <laughs> like no, you're not. But okay, you're not. Yeah, you're not. You're just a critic. 
<laughs> <You're> just <laughs> right. being critics. You just know what you like and what you don't like, and you put that out there. And let me say this: journalism has always been in a place where you can put something out, you can put an article out, and people you're not going to make everyone happy. You might get mm-hmm. you might get email, or you might. You know, someone might not like how you portray them in an article or whatever. But where we are now is everything is so clannish and divisive. So, mm-hmm. like, let's say somebody puts out, I don't know, a paper or an article about some controversial thing. And if you read it, for all intents and purposes, it, it might be well written and well balanced and and not sensational at all. But it's just this is the thing. Here are the stats. This is why we're saying what we're saying. The who, what, why, when, where, how. But now, because of the blogosphere, you can find mm-hmm. a paper that counters that. And so, and, and it might not be well-researched, but just because it counters that, what you're going to have is people who don't like paper A are going to go over here to paper B. I agree yeah. with this. So this is it. This, that's it. And, and so yeah, we're, we're screwed. Like, it's, it's very much now people are just going off of, like, how they feel, or what they like and what they don't like, and not necessarily mm-hmm. the information. Another thing that skews it is like, you know, people throw the term around media literacy often, Mm -hmm. but I think it's a lot to do with that. Like if we think about the ways we grew up, media or things outside of your home, those entities were things you could trust. So if the newspapers, well, not all marginalized people, but in general, the newspaper said something, you kind of trusted that that was the truth. Or if you saw something on the news, you trusted that was the truth. So I think we're we're kind of in a, a part of time where that is meeting, where like, because it's posted somewhere or because you read it somewhere else, then it must be true. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that people are making that distinction that media, we use that term loosely, entities could like not tell the truth or people don't know that a lot of times these opinion-based things are like, you know, you used to see a article and it would say op-ed so you knew that this was the opinion exactly. of the person writing versus now it's just like just you know everybody calls everything a think piece now but it's just you know and you just take it for what it is also because you have a parasocial relationship with who is speaking or who Mm -hmm. is writing or who Mm -hmm. is whatever so you just take it as truth you know people fan you know oprah or you didn't um that's a poor example. You wasn't like, ooh, Diane Sawyer said it, so it must be the truth. Right, 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 right. No, I get it. I get it. I get it. You know? I get it. And it's, it's so interesting, too, because I'm not a psychologist, but there's definitely a lot of psychology involved in this, too, and how information is disseminated. And I'll take yeah. this back to when I was in college. So they made us, I remember we had to take a social psych, at, at least one or two, I feel like two two semesters mm-hmm. of a social psychology class. And I remember at the time, I was like, I'm trying to be a journalist. I'm trying to be communication. This is the EV major. Why y'all got me in this psychology class? And like, <laughs> but now seeing how this is playing out, like the way information gets disseminated, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can see your tweet and maybe at the time, you know who tweeted it, right? But then let's, unless you like what they said in the tweet, maybe like a few days later, you're repeating what you saw in the tweet, but yes. you're not even thinking about it. Like, yes. oh, that person said that first. You're saying it like you said it, like it came from your... So there's also, I don't know, how, I don't quite know how to explain this properly, but there's some of that too. Like the way yes. you absorb information and how things start to change and memory can make things happen. And and I don't know, but I, I think you get where I'm trying to go with it. Like there's a, there's a lot of like, just loose information floating around and then like you don't know where it came from but now you're you're spouting it off like like, like it's you fact just created or, it like it's fact yeah, yeah like you created it or it's fact yeah. I, I, even for myself i can't say like you know i've been podcasting for so long and like you know doing all of this media space stuff for so long where even i started to and i appreciate early on realizing like wait one i have influence two people like or take what i say as you know like truth or fact even mm-hmm, if i say mm-hmm. You know, I'm not too sure. This is a thought that I'm just playing with. People take it as People fact. People don't hear that I, part. I, yeah, they not don't. Hear that part. Yeah, at all. And you have to. It is your responsibility as someone who creates media to understand the influence you have. And mm-hmm. I don't think that integrity piece that we keep that keeps coming up is not there because Definitely the money. Not. Definitely not. Because Definitely not. the money. Like, yeah, money, I kind of, I attention. kind of agree with you. Yeah, yes, the money and the intention. Yes, both of those things. Because it makes me think of me and my um friends were in a group chat and we were talking about, 
I have a friend that they're not from New York. They're from the Midwest and they live in the South. So they don't have the relationship that I have with Wendy Williams or right, like we have right, with Wendy right, Williams, right? right. I, I and the then Wendy compare- Black like, like she was on the radio, by the way. Yeah, black like, in the radio and like we have a different relationship <laughs> yeah, with Wendy yeah. Williams. And they compared Wendy Williams to Jason Lee. And oh me my and my- Yes. <laughs> I grew up in New York, by the way. So yes. no, absolutely We not. are New Yorkers. So it was like, what? <laughs> And to them, it was like, well, they do the, the same thing. And it's like, no, like, even with Wendy Williams' salaciousness as far as the type of media she presented, because usually the gossipy stuff was, like, in the tabloids and stuff. It wasn't, mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. on the radio on the way in which she revolutionized that space, I believe. Mm-hmm, I agree. She still had, a, she still had a, like, a journalistic kind of integrity with her stuff, even with the messiness mm-hmm. that Jason Lee would never have because it's really all about being seen. And being famous exactly. and being friends with famous people. And Jason there was Lee a. Had, I'm sorry to cut you off. He had said uh-huh. something sometime earlier this year. Everything's a blur. But he said mm-hmm. something along the lines of like, this is not verbatim, but like Beyonce better interview with him. Otherwise, he's going to put out something that he knows about her that's damaging. And that's where we are now. He's not the only one that's done this. Like mm-hmm. now you have a lot of bloggers who are like, I didn't get an interview with this person. So now I'm going to, I'm going to make their life miserable. That's what happened with Tasha K and Cardi B. Mm-hmm. That was not Wendy Williams. Yeah, they, they, exactly. These are very different entities. That's crazy. Exactly. That is crazy. And even with Wendy Williams, there were celebrities she had issues with. She would let them come on and curse her out, you know, like, mm-hmm. because right. it was like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's the other side. <laughs> You know, this is what I this is what I kicked up. So this is you know whatever. Right, right. Whereas right. We, we see like a Jason Lee or whatever, they will weaponize the the relationship to get what they want. Where it's just mm-hmm. like the story is that Bernie Houston don't like me, so I'm gonna have call a station. Right. And she, right. you know, like it's, it's <laughs> a very different way of which I guess the route to get the story is very mm-hmm. different, like compared mm-hmm. to like a Wendy Williams or a Jason Lee. You know, mm-hmm. but yeah, I just have I know my homegirl watching this. They are not the same. They are not the same. No. <laughs> they, are not the same. they are not the same. Another thing that I noticed in comparison to black media versus, I guess, mainstream mm-hmm. media is that the world kind of lumps all of our media into entertainment. Mm-hmm. Whereas in mainstream, you're able to have New York Times, you're able to have a mm-hmm. post, mm-hmm. you're able to have a TMZ. And those things are like their own respective spaces and you know what to expect for them you know who to go to for what so you're going to go to the new york times for this Mm -hmm. you're going to go to the washington post for this tmz has this but for some reason when it comes to our media it's the entertainment space Mm -hmm. that is always the most highlighted and always where they go to to talk to black people why do you think that is it's very true and it is spot on and i don't know if i fully have an answer but i will point out that one thing that is frustrating for me as a journalist, and I'm, mm-hmm. I may be for people who, who own Black media or run Black media, is that you have outlets who have always had to be so many things for the Black community. Yeah. Like, BET is expected to have, and they've tried. They have entertainment. They have BET News. You had Teen Summit. You had all these different things. And it's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to be uncut? Or are you going to be like, you know what I mean? You can't make everybody happy. And that's, and I don't, I don't know what to, I don't know how to answer that because that is, that's been an issue. Like, obviously we know black people aren't a monolith and, you know, there probably should be a publication for um, black people in in the God space or black people who want more hard hitting news that, that Mm -hmm. black people. And a lot of times the outlets, our outlets have to try to be all those things for everybody. And that. I think that that's been a detriment to us as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how it got that way. I think if I'm going to take a guess, resources, um, mm-hmm. the, scarcity, resources right? the scarcity, and then sometimes people might be scared to take a chance. Like they feel like, well, if I do launch this publication about, um, I don't know, well, we'll go back to black goths, right? To mm-hmm. ethnic- just using that that is technically entertainment but like they might be scared like i don't want to launch this publication for the for that group of people because they're not gonna 
you know, maybe people won't respond. They're going to call us devil worshipers or whatever, or like (laughs) even for a more hard hitting news uh, piece. So traditionally I've been an entertainment journalist and then I kind of shifted more to, to, to focus, to to incorporate more um, culture in terms of like one of my favorite stories that I've ever written was about black women in streetwear and how Mm -hmm. I, I found women in fashion who had knowledge and history and not just like book knowledge, but like these women were from places like Philly and New York and, mm-hmm. you know, they grew up in that like hip hop stuff and then they end up working in fashion. So it's kind of like a historical piece about how um, you're starting to see more visibility now with black women in streetwear or, or are you? I think that was the question I was asking. That, that was a piece that you could say lied at the intersection of culture and entertainment. I was at an outlet one time and I wrote a story because I also like to write about health and fitness. Don't have much of a space for that, particularly where it relates to Black people because mm-hmm. a lot of the magazines don't want that, right? And the only mm-hmm. time I get that space in Self Magazine is in, in 2020 when when all the George Floyd stuff was happening and now they realize, oh, we need more Black voices. I, I ran across some stat that condom use was on the decline. And <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm a nerd, so it just sent me down this rabbit hole of like, WTF, right? So what ended up happening was I wrote an article about the decline in condom use. And that article was a hit. So like the publishers and everyone was like, oh my God, this is great. I didn't think this would do well. But then I write an article about World HIV AIDS Day and I'm talking about the stats. It was crickets. So Mm -hmm. it's always that too. Like people just afraid to take chances as well. And that, that affects the Black outlets more so because we don't have the resources really to try. I'm going to start where we're used to talking about BET. We'll have one Black media entity trying to do everything. Even if we have a media space, we're, we're trying so hard to like please everyone in the space that mm-hmm. it kind of ex- exasperates mm-hmm. the space, you know? And I think that's something that a lot of people don't talk about. Even me, I didn't even think about it until you said it because I'm just like, what is everybody doing? Being angry and like getting upset because Essence is writing ridiculous articles to me lately. <laughs> and- <laughs> they be going, but you see that be going viral. They be yes. going viral. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, you know, like how many articles are we going to get about Amanda Seals? But they see it goes viral. Written by people that probably don't even know her. Girl, that's tea. Since we're talking about Essence, I've always saw Essence as a classist. I didn't know oh, what yeah, that language sure. was when I was a kid, but it was just like, that's not how the black woman I know look. So it was just like different. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's just becoming more evident, like the classism. That There's definitely is classism at those magazines. There's definitely mean girls, mean boys. Like mm-hmm. there's definitely that behind the scenes. I worked at a, a magazine, a legacy magazine that is for black people. And I remember being in meetings and having like the, the, what was she at the time? CFO, CEO, I don't know. Like being mm-hmm. stared at because I, I've had my locks for a very long time, right? Like it was definitely, I used to joke with another person on staff how it was definitely giving Jigaboos versus wannabes, right? Mm. And like there was a there was a girl there who did pub, uh, who did PR for, for the magazine. And at that time, I think she was relatively new in, this, in PR. Maybe she had just graduated, whatever. But she used to wear mm-hmm. her hair in an afro. She had 4C mm-hmm. hair. And you know how Black folks feel about 4C hair. Like, let's, let's, yes. let's be real. So, but she, you could tell she wasn't going to over manipulate her hair. Like, she would just wake up. Maybe she would put on a headband. Maybe not. Maybe she mm-hmm. would mess with it. She let her she hair do what it does. Hair. Exactly. And we, I remember we had an event. And I was, uh, the CFO cursed her out for showing up. She had the audacity to show up the way she she is. And was the, the CFO was like, you know, you're going to do with your hair. How dare you come here and show up like that? And that is like just going in on her. And I remember that validated my feelings of, because I had, I remember being in meetings and feeling like she was looking me up and down and Mm -hmm. you always try to tell yourself, no, that's not what it is. They're not like, that's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. and, And after I saw her do that, I was like, oh, that's exactly what it is. And but what had happened was I established myself as you're not going to talk to me crazy. Like at that mm-hmm. point in my career, I remember she had said something slick to me and I said something slick back. It was like very nice, nasty. And like she never said anything slick to me again after that. But I've seen her like going off to people. And but that incident with her about her hair, like she's humiliating this girl in front of people. It wasn't even like you could at least pull her to the side. Like if you were exactly. going to be on that. But yeah, so all that behind the scenes, it's, it's very, 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 there, there's very much 
a, a fraternal kind of like you're here, you're here, you're here, you're here, here, here. that sort of thing. Like a tiered kind of system. Oh, sure. For sure. And so that obviously definitely harms the people who work for these these publications. Mm -hmm. There was a period of time where a few publications, black publications that Mm -hmm. were like, couldn't pay people or like, you know, these expose pieces are coming out from, Mm -hmm. from not even just black media entities, also from other entities where black people were working and they're just Mm -hmm. talking about Mm -hmm. all of the harm. Like, is there anything you could speak to, to that? Um, Cause that could be also why people kind of just like push out to just, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. Like I'm just Mm -hmm. doing a podcast or I'm just going to just do my own blog or so and so and so and so like, so can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's how I feel. But yeah, the harm, a lot of it was that behind the scenes stuff of like definitely having the click, the C-suite click, and then everybody else is whatever, right? And then like you have a trickle down where maybe you have an editor in chief who they they get berated by the CFO. So now the editor in chief Mm -hmm. then starts to berate their staff. And I wrote that in a magazine where we used to get called into meetings specifically to be cursed out, like (laughs) legit, like if 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 the traffic wasn't what it was supposed to be and like they would encourage encourage us to do what we needed to do to make that traffic pop right and it's it's crazy and like going to the financial aspect of it um yeah that's definitely been a problem part of it i think is the traditionalist nature of a lot of these the black publications it, it, it kind of, it held them back for a long time. And that even mm-hmm. stemmed to something as seemingly as simple as how you handle accounting and your books, right? Like this is the age where people are going digital. People are getting paid through direct deposit, but you don't want to hire a direct deposit agency because you want to be cheap. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, goodness, yeah. stuff like that, like switch up your accounting. Maybe okay. these people need to stop using whatever paper system was used and y'all need to step mm-hmm. into the new millennium. So yeah, there's there's a lot of that. There's been a lot of that. That's that's almost that's I don't know. I'm just like so surprised <laughs> because like a lot of people would be listen in this age of telling, right? Like everybody telling, everybody snitching. There are so many people who have not said things publicly that I've heard behind the scenes or that I've experienced that I've seen. And mm-hmm. I swear to God, all these entities better thank their lucky stars that they are not being put on blast. That doesn't mean it's never going to happen. Man, it, yeah. It's, it's happening because the Diddy stories, the Diddy story has been around. Right. Mm-hmm. But now it's coming forward because Cassie filed the lawsuit and mm-hmm. I guess they gave more people courage to. Like, like, all right, I'm putting out a lawsuit. And it's not just famous people that have Diddy stories. I've heard Diddy stories from regular people that work for, like, uh, he has a market or he had a marketing. I don't know if he still has it. A marketing company, right, called Blue Flame. And mm-hmm. I know people that were on making the band. So, and that made it pretty far in the process that have their yeah. story. Like, you know what I mean? So you hear those stories mm-hmm. from all sides and now they're coming out. And the thing is, people are people have been afraid because this is a capitalist society. You still got to work. Don't nobody want to be homeless, right? And so mm-hmm. you might you might just not say anything because it always falls on you. Like the people with the power, even if they're awful people, they're always the one that that are given they're given some kind of grace. Like grace. oh, you shouldn't have said mm-hmm. that about them. We, mm-hmm. we still want them to come to the parties because they still pull the purse strings or they still have influence. So that's why a lot of people don't say stuff. They might say it to their friend, but they're not going to get on Twitter and be like, oh, this is what happened. Or lawyers are expensive. So maybe they don't have it. Mm-hmm. Lawyers be like seven hundred dollars an hour. So yeah, you know what I'm saying. So there's a, there's a lot of factors in that too. You make me think of I did a video about how the Me Too movement failed the women of hip hop, mm-hmm. and in that video I talk about Benzino, and because <laughs> I know people that work for the source under him, <laughs> and I talk about Benzino, and I knew he was a harmful person, but mm-hmm. I I guess I hadn't, and I think it's probably on purpose. How we haven't realized how like the hip hop industry and a lot of black media kind of are in bed with each other or mm-hmm. entwined with each other mm-hmm. in a way. And it wasn't until I like read the details of the case, you know, that you know, he was sued for for the sexual harassment right. and all of that stuff. And I think it's important for us to see how aligned all of those industries are, because if the people who are writing the stories are in, in bed mm-hmm. with these artists who are harmful and harming the hip hop industry, like there's no progress made. That's why the Me Too movement wasn't something really effective for women of hip hop because okay. who's going to write that story? Like we we still haven't, at least I haven't, seen a really good investigative story about Diddy. 
because of the relationship that our entertainment industry has with hip hop, you know, and it does a disservice. That's why I was so annoyed about all of these Amanda articles or that article about yep. Ramonte. <laughs> and I'm like, we are literally seeing the takedown of Diddy in real time. And y'all are talking about Ramonte not getting influencer right. money. Right, right. And I just and I just mentioned the Diddy stories are legendary. They've been around. So somebody, mm-hmm. somebody might talk. There might be a source. <laughs> you know how a lot of com- a lot of magazines they be like a source close to the situation. I mean, there's sources. <laughs> Yeah, that would be an excellent use of resources. And um, we just haven't really seen that happen. I think these men are still in positions where they can pretend that it didn't happen. They can say, oh, I didn't do these things. And there's enough people to believe them. Or maybe people were in cahoots. Or maybe people still feel like I can use this person for an income source or for an opportunity. So I don't want to be the one to say something. Like, yeah, it's... It's it's really sad. And I actually I tweeted about this. I have I have a colleague who used to be a journalist. She's not anymore. And mm-hmm. um she told me, and this is a legend, I gotta protect myself, yeah. us. She yeah. told me that she was supposed to interview Mystical for a magazine. And they it was gonna be kind of like so they, they used to give us writers more access to artists so like you might find yourself spending a day in the studio or spending yeah. you know a lot mm-hmm. of time with them and she said it was kind of like a ride around type thing but he like kept pushing up on her and she made it clear that this is not that like I'm here to talk to you I'm trying to get this story going and mm. he left her stranded at a gas station in the middle of wherever they were. Well, we know his track record, so... Is that, that's what I'm saying. And this is before all that stuff about him came, came out. So came out. Mm-hmm. That stuff was bubbling. And the publication did not protect her. They did not... They just were like, well, you're fine. You're safe. You made it. You know, you're mm-hmm. okay. It's great. And I mean, I have my own experience with someone, a actor that people like, that um, pushed up on me in, a, in an interview setting. And it's all this crazy stuff goes on in your brain. I'm from Uptown. I'm from Harlem, East Harlem. I'm Mm -hmm. an East Harlem Bronx girl. So in my mind, it's like, my instinct is I had to work really hard to get that, (laughs) like, to get that out of me, right? Like, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be professional. Like, oh, I'm going to be a journalist. So I'm just sitting there like, this man is really saying this stuff to me. So what I ended up doing was I cut the interview short. I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, we're done. And I left. And I told the publicist, I said, listen, your client did X, Y, and Z when we were in there. The publicist was like, oh, he just didn't take his medication. So you see what I'm saying? Like, there's no protection. Like, no one cares. Everyone tries to trivialize everything and, and brush it off. And now, mind you, it, it was a white lady. I don't, I, I'm inclined to feel like that made it, that it would have made a difference yeah. if it was a black woman. I feel like mm-hmm. the black publicists I've met have been a little more inclined to take care of us. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, like there's so many stories like that. And but this actor is a big name person. And at the time, I'm trying to think, was he? It, it was a it was a it was a major movie that we that mm-hmm. we were, um, but it wasn't yeah, it was like a, a major movie he was in. So mm-hmm. um yeah, like that takes precedent over everything. Because money. Because yeah. money. If you are a just a blogger, not to like like reduce it because I'm also a podcaster, but like a podcaster who doesn't have a media trained background or mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. whatever, like how do you know what little bit of agency you have? It's the wild, if wild it, wits. You know, it's I, f- I feel like the, the 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 little layer of protection that you probably have as a trained journalist, as a publication, like at least you had someone to call to complain to, even though you didn't get results. But mm-hmm. at the very mm-hmm. least, there was that like who like a self-made podcaster or a self-made blogger or media influencer. You don't have that to not have that layer of protection is like harmful, but also it does mess with the integrity of the work and like mm-hmm. what is put out there and what is said. You're like easy, more easily brought. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it makes me think of when Tory Lane with the Tory Lane's trial, I'm sure so many of those ridiculous blogs or whatever, I'm sure that they were brought, you Definitely. know, we'll say alleged cause I don't got no money, but right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> 
but no, there there are those farm. There's farms, right? Like a lot of people blame record labels for this. I can't I can't speak to whether it's labels or not, but somebody, mm-hmm. whether it's the the person themselves or like somebody, they can pay a blogger to be like, I need you to write a favorable story about this person. Mm. And they can pay a blogger to say, I need you to write something negative about this person. And I've heard a few people, um, like, a, 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 I'm put one name out there. Taylor Swift is someone that I heard had that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's true or not, but like a lot of these mm-hmm. big name people. And then even beyond just paying, there's there are ways you can pay bloggers to skew a story without even directly giving them money. Like you could mm-hmm. do something like, okay, I see this blogger has a platform. I know I have a name and a platform. So wh- I'm going to invite this blogger to my birthday party. Come, come, come through to my birthday party. Let's be friends. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. always going to skew the relationship. And a lot of times bloggers who do have these relationships with people, they'll be like, oh, well, I still said what I want. That's my friend. It's like, yeah, that's, that's a lie. Cause if that person wants yeah. to practice, they could. So that creates that bias too. Yeah. And that's the difference between Jason Lee and Wendy Williams. <laughs> I like how she that definitely wasn't trying to be friends with everybody. She definitely she was wasn't. Not. She wasn't, and it's kind of sad because she's so alone now. But yeah, you know, you know, she, that's she. That's wasn't that wasn't what she was trying to do. And I think that that line does need to be there, and that line not existing is is why we see so much of the harm. And also, like, there's no repercussions. So I'm thinking mm-hmm. about the Tory Lanez case and how there was really no repercussions for pushing what they were pushing as far as Megan. And it was just like, it was for me, that was the first time in real time that I saw, I guess in our generation, media kind of writing its own story or like Mm -hmm. rewriting a story. Like I I can think of stuff and I was a kid though, but like thinking of like, you know, Mike Tyson or like Tupac, stuff in the past where the stories yeah, I need a hill where the media skewed Monica the story. <laughs> yeah, yes. Because the I'm, media skewed it and made it something else. They do it to women all the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but I I'm, think I've been looking back at a lot of those things, so realizing many things. how yeah. painted my lens was as a kid versus now as an adult. And you know so much, you know better now. Exactly. And it's so like all of that. Like, yeah. Monica Lewinsky, all of that stuff. I'm just like, whoa. Like I remember as a, I remember not liking Robin Gibbons. I don't even know why. I did, but it was, she was but, trying to take the black man down. Yeah. Why she do that to Mike Tyson? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm an adult. Like why the hell? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it's, it's sad to see that cycle continue. I think seeing what happened with Megan is what for me, like ignited, like, oh my God, we're still doing this. We're mm-hmm. still, doing this to women. We're still doing this to black women. I was so fascinated and disturbed by Megan, especially because like now this is happening. I'm an adult. I can't speak to all of Mike Tyson's shenanigans, even though, you know, the adults around me, but Mm -hmm. seeing this, like for me, just at base level, why, why is it so hard to believe that a man who has a history of violence against was men violent. and women was why is it hard to believe that he was violent that he made shot someone <laughs> like that just boggles my mind how people were trying to twist this well she did this and she did, and i i have not heard anything that would say that would make me be like she deserved to be shot and that's what the what people were trying to turn the story into which yeah. was crazy yeah yeah i i that was too. Yeah, I was just like, I, I appreciate who I've grown to be, but also like, whoa, like it's just mm-hmm. disheartening to see that media still operate in that way. I'm like, regardless of how integral you try to be, because I'm sure in those moments too, with like Anita Hill or um, Ayanna Jackson or whatever, mm-hmm. I'm sure there were journalists who were like, no, <laughs> you know, the story is this. And, you know, it's just... And even then, you had journalists who were probably friends with Pop that took yes. it easy on him. So yeah, exactly. Especially because you know he had knowledge itself and blah 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 blah. You know how he categorized. <laughs> it was so work. It was so conscious. They just trying to take him down. He probably was trying to buy NBC. Like what? <laughs> Hey, what? The cycle of this is just continues. We're seeing it with Diddy. Like there's people who are still standing firm with Diddy, and we're seeing how he's. Trying to rebrand, like you riding a bicycle. I've I've seen you my whole life, Diddy, and you're riding bicycles now. 
I knew I knew it was gonna fall apart when he started calling himself Brother Love. I was like, oh no, that that is a truly toxic individual. He he, he yeah. Okay, your days are numbered. Oh, I knew it. The power of media is immense. Mm-hmm. It's like hugely immense, and that's why. Although, like, we're talking about stuff that happened in the past that feel like very much like what's happening right now like it makes me think has media always been in crisis <laughs> and that's what i was saying if you look at media history there's always been just this crazy sensationalism i feel like there's an era in media history i don't remember the specific dates but it's called mccarthyism mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it was there was this man who was this like i think he was a i don't know if he was a christian ev- event evangelical he was some kind of like preacher, a priest, Mm -hmm. may have also been a politician. And he promoted so much anti-immigrant sentiment. And I feel like I have to look this up to be sure, but I want to say this was maybe right before World War II or during Mm -hmm. or something, but he had a huge role in creating that anti-immigrant hysteria. And the media was his vehicle. Like the media was always covering the stuff yes. that he would say. <laughs> so because they that knew makes get the people going. Then you make me think of um because Henry Ford, like cars, Ford cars, whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Henry mm-hmm. Ford had a really big magazine in the United States that was very anti-Semitic. And a lot of the anti-Semitic tropes that like live in the US and obviously in Europe are from Henry Ford. And he had a magazine, like he used media Mm -hmm. to push that. And I don't think that people, even if you're doing light media or whatever, I Mm -hmm. I don't think people understand the way in which media influences the world and influences our, everyone's everyday life. Like the politics of the world are hugely based on what the media tells us is going on in the world and what the media tells us is true or not. Or whatever, and, um, and, and I know even, for me, I just kind of wish that. I think it's great that now me, more people have access to do media. Mm-hmm. Um, so the gatekeepers that formerly existed aren't there. Mm-hmm. But then also that means anybody. It's, it's a gift and a curse because like literally anybody can come and 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 speak into the the power of media like throughout the centuries and the decades. I see all this like Nazi propaganda being repurposed. And I'm like, yes. does nobody realize that this is like the, the idea that immigrants are coming to take someone's place? Like I'm, I'm seeing these these groups of black people now who are like, oh, well, mm-hmm. my people are we're slaves of, of the United States or we're foundational of the United States. And, but then they say stuff like black immigrants are coming to take take our place. They're coming to replace our. I've seen anything from they're coming to take our place. They're taking all our jobs. They're they're diluting our voting capital all these things that stem from that nazi propaganda yes stem, it's yes. Crazy. stem from that directly and then also shows how much of history you do not know because there's so mm-hmm. much um especially when it comes to Korean black people there's so much ingrained in our history like together like you don't get a marcus Garvey if caribbean people don't exist you don't even get a malcolm x because his mother exactly. was great you know, like so Kwame, much Kwame Kure, right like he, his yeah you don't you don't get an audrey lord you don't there's, there's exactly like, there were so many black there was so much black diversity in our our historic civil yes. rights movements so and, and people just don't know that they were freaking Haitians you that, the that point in the, the, of the Schomburg, right? And like <laughs> there, there was a uh, the Haitian soldiers fought in the who was it the American Revolution? Like yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, like that lack of his. And that's the thing. Like I feel like, and honestly, when I went into journalism, I naively thought, oh, I could use entertainment as a vehicle to kind of educate in some way. And I always used to mm-hmm. like to try to find sort of what's the edutainment in it? Or like, what's the educational angle? Like maybe you could pepper a little history fact and they, outlets don't care. Outlets don't care. People don't care. <laughs> like, I hate to sound so cynical, but that, like, I don't know. Like we went from like the, the gatekeeping, it, it went from not letting certain people in to now the floodgates have opened, but it's like, it's just, Everybody in their mama's in there. So there's still no, like, no, go ahead. As as we're talking about gatekeepers, like we, the human gatekeepers are gone, but now we have algorithmic gatekeepers. So like, that part, 
you can you gotta pay for visibility you, you gotta pay for visibility or if your content is like too like i have a video that i did about islamic islamophobia and, and anti-semitism and how they oh, kind of embed with each other <laughs> that's like one of my least viewed videos because mm-hmm. the algorithm was like nah that's we're not doing that but let you have done oh. a video about black. And I, I, I'm a, I'm sorry to cut you off, but as someone who pays attention to this, I've been seeing some disturbing things with the algorithm, and it usually happens in an election year. So mm-hmm. I try to be um, on top of at least trying to program my algorithm to show me things I want to see. I like to yeah. see nails. I like to see cats. I like to see black people dancing. We got the, you know we got the same <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> That's what I want to see. <laughs> and, and like, but I'm I'm liking stuff, commenting to make sure I see that. And it'll be like, maybe the algorithm will get it for a hot second. Like I'll come onto my Instagram and be like, hey, this is what I want to see. But then all of a sudden I'm starting to see Manosphere stuff creeping into my timeline. I'm starting to see, like I, I went on YouTube today and there was a video that said black people are finally waking up. It was basically a pro-Trump video. And I'm like, how on earth would, would we be here? Like, why do you think I want to see this? I that, want to see this. So that that algorithm is a, a, a very wicked component of this too. That yeah. propaganda, that rage, all of that stuff starts to seep in, even if you don't want to see it. And there's yeah. so many impressionable minds that see it. And all it takes is one point that people agree with. And it's like, you know, they do got a point though. And then that's it. Yeah, because that actually makes me... <laughs> Um, I didn't watch the Candace Owen interview on the Breakfast Club, and I didn't listen to Joe Budden's podcast. I think she was yeah, on there also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I know that's what happened. That's just, like she said, maybe two things, and someone was like, "She do have some points." Because I I saw comment sections where people was like, "You know, she did Same. make sense," or she mm-hmm. did, and I'm like, "What?" Right? <laughs> Since when? Same. Same. <laughs> I do think the Breakfast Club tried to redeem itself a little bit when they had um, Mayor Adams on and they had Olay to that, kind yeah, of um, yeah, yeah. counter. So, so, so that was like how to have a host like, OK, I don't particularly care for the Breakfast Club or Charlemagne, Same. you know, whatever. But not even but I will say that because they are the biggest inter- entertainment space, unfortunately, mm-hmm. that that is where people are going to go. Yep, and it is unfortunate that it is that space that people think has the most value for us. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not Charlemagne's fault. I don't like it, but that's not their fault. Right. It's just harmful and annoying to know that there's someone who has who doesn't have the range. No one on that show has the range. Him, Envy, um, and, who and, the other person? Uh, just hilarious. That's definitely definitely don't have the range. And even before her, Angela, Angeli, I don't know if Angela have the have, range. I don't think she did. It's, she never pushed she, back. No, she didn't. She didn't. She would just sit there and drink her green juice and like, exactly. <laughs> and and here's T. Here's T. I don't know specifically how the ins and outs of the Breakfast Club work, but just having I've worked in radio, I've worked in spaces like that. I'm pretty sure that they don't even have like. It's clear that they don't know what they're talking about, but they halfway yeah. don't even select the stories that they put out there. It's that's mm-hmm. usually the work of interns. Like interns will mm-hmm. scroll through what's the popular story today. All right, these are the five top stories, and we'll hand off a paper with a summary to these people. And then they'll and shoot that's it. So that's another part of this. Which is which is okay if you're just doing entertainment, which is right. okay if you're like talking about probably rappers or whatever. You're not going that deep. Because it's a radio, you know, it's, it's more talk radio now. But, like, when we were younger, it was like they were talking and you hear some music. So right. it wasn't just, you know, whatever. And it's – the format has to change. You need to have someone – if that if you're going to be talking about these things, you need to have someone there who knows these things. Exactly. Not just a DJ, not just a comedia, comedian, and not just a former shock jock who says he has and, therapy. And then on top of that, y'all are always confused anyway. Like <laughs> – <laughs> The few times that I've tried to get through the breakfast call, I'm like, why can't you get through this simple three paragraph news story? Like, what in, what the heck? Like, why do you always need clarity about who was who and this? Like, this, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, and it's like I get trying to um, blend the worlds of like, um, because none of them have traditional media background i will say that charlemagne did come up with wendy like she, he probably was, had a really good mentor for wendy when he when he came on and and that's oh, a whole real? other her, her wendy's husband just basically forced that situation that's the whole oh, other, i'll never forget one day we showed up to the pink room the interns and we were like who is this <laughs> <laughs> who is this 
<laughs> it was just so random. And like, Brittany was just like, oh yeah, that's Charlamagne. He's going to be on the show. And you could tell mm. she didn't like it, but like, mm. that's, that's what Kevin wanted. Kevin was just infatuated with him and was like, this is what it is. I'm so happy for Kevin's downfall. Yes. <laughs> Yes. There's one more thing I've thought about now. Um, because we talk about how the media, black media spaces get exasperated because they're trying to do everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that happens to um the individuals in the media space. So like mm-hmm. um, or we just expect you to do one thing. So like mm-hmm. let's say like a Mark Lamar Hill, you know, you expect him to be the smart talking head. But if he says something about, I don't know, basketball, it's like, shut up. <laughs> Talk politics. <laughs> that happens too. Yep. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so it's like, you know, Dan, if we send Dan, if we do Dan, if we don't. So it's like, we get upset. Um, and I do. I get upset that there are certain people that, um, that Charlemagne has access to. I get upset. But also, like. They're, like they're, an Angela uh, Rye, like what? Like what do y'all be talking about? <laughs> I don't know, and I could, and I, as someone who knows Charlemagne behind the scenes, mm-hmm. I understand uh, why people don't like him because what he puts out there is just like, yes. and I'm not saying that's not him. What I'm trying to say, like, you might wonder, like, how is he friends with like an Angela Rye or? Um, what was that lady's I name? I wonder that Tiffany all the Crow. time, Angela Rock. Like all the all the all the all the black women he's friends with. I'm like, how? Because he means well. That's the crazy part. And like, they all I say have, that. I've seen him behind the scenes, like legit help people get jobs and make connections. Mm-hmm. And and it kind of goes back to the psychological aspect of like, okay, this is a person who who's been able to help me or who can help me. And I don't know. Like, I don't know what conversations they would have with him about things that he said that were harmful. I like I I really don't know. But um I do understand the sort of conflict of interest and in, like because I even see people saw people saying they didn't like Amanda Seals because she was friends with Charlemagne. And mm-hmm. I'm just like people behind the scenes can be you can have a very different relationship than what they put out in public. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's not him because I he's definitely said some off the cuffs things and honestly he's grown since i've been around him but um that that there's just like a weird conundrum there i don't i don't know what to say i think it that. i think i think it speaks to and i think it's a natural kind of thing like he's someone at work so that's who he is as a performer or whatever mm-hmm. the heck mm-hmm. and for myself i had to um not everyone lives like me. Like I am the work I do also reflects the person I am. Right. Um, and not everybody works in that, you know, people code switch all the time and that maybe yeah. that's just a different yeah. form yeah. of code switching that I can't, I can't relate, but <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> can't relate. right. But maybe that's what that is. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure or whatever, but I do think that because of the harms, the amount of harm that they have mm-hmm. caused, it is very, very difficult for me to understand the relationships that he's able to obtain with black women. And then also, um, I can't separate it. It's like, and I don't care yeah, how much you've grown. I get it. And you know, I'm not a carceral person or whatever, but sometimes there's so much harm that you have caused, so many narratives that you put out, so for the sake of being a shock jock, that like, right. I'm sorry, there's no redemption. And, and self awareness is key too. Like that's the mm-hmm. thing. Like if somebody you know, if you know politics isn't your strong suit, why are you going on this bigger platform to discuss politics? And you don't know what you're talking about, but you, you know people are going to hang on to every word. And and not even just with Charlemagne, just across the board. Like even mm-hmm. with you, when I was at Vibe, um, and this was kind of the start of that whole like ask a celebrity something important. Like, why Mm -hmm. am I asking Slim Thug about, I don't know, the, his thoughts on Hillary Clinton's super predator policy or whatever, like, you know, exactly. You know what I'm saying? And the answer is always, that's what people want. And it's like, so you want me to put this out to our detriment just because it's going to get the people going versus maybe asking someone who can actually speak to policy about that. Yeah. And it's like, I don't. I, you know, you have a more inside 
view of it. But it's like, is it really what people want? Because like, like when I use that Mark Lamont Hill example, like, no, we want the politic motherfuckers to stay over here. We want the funny niggas over here. <laughs> we want, like we we <laughs> we do because that's how we react when they do something outside of it. We be like, go back to your corner, you know. So it's you like, know what? It's always gonna be SEO. Like there mm-hmm. might be more of us that are like, I don't want that, but maybe we don't engage. Maybe it's more of the people that that show up, yeah, right? That's what true. I'm trying to say, it's always it's always a numbers game. It's yeah. that's part of our downfall. It's always a numbers game. Oh, this article did this many hits this time, so you got to figure out how to recreate that. So that's part yeah, of our downfall. Yeah. Don't take the bait, y'all. <laughs> like something like Seriously. this, love, let it go. I promise you. A retweet is still engagement. A hate comment is still engagement. Don't don't take the bait. Don't do it. Seriously, yes, yeah, seriously. I think journalists. Ooh, if you know journalists, check on them, especially Black journalists. Our mental health is not okay. Definitely, if you can, support. And I'm going to bring bloggers into this too. Journalists, uh-huh. but also bloggers who really try to source properly and, and be responsible with their platform. People who are responsible with their platforms need your support. And that could be mm-hmm. anything. It could be whether you are paying for a subscription, whether you see an article that you like and you share it and engage with it. Engagement is king now. That's the mm-hmm. name of the game, unfortunately. Platforms that try, like I think like ProPublica is one of my favorite platforms. Like if yeah, you I like want, that. Like the, mm-hmm. You know, like politics and worldview. And a, a girl that I went to college with is actually, um, I don't remember her title, but she's over. Pro- she's like one of the higher ranking editors mm-hmm. up there. And she's dope. And I, I knew even back then she was like, like I was trying to be entertainment journalist, but she was like, no, journalism has the power to save the world. And like, so it was beautiful to see her at, at ProPublica. Mm-hmm. Well. And I think she got nominated for Pulitzer, but um, oh, great. yeah, but no. So like definitely try to support platforms that really do the work. So put ProPublica out there. I really like Joy Reid. I like the work that she does. Mm-hmm. I like that she tries. I like Tremaine Lee. He's another one who... He's really serious about the journalism that he does. So what I just say is find those voices that that try to be responsible with their platform. Try to take your your feelings out of it. Like we're it, we're human. So it is natural to be like, oh, I like this person. So I'm going to follow them. But still understand mm-hmm. they're human. And yes. if you start to notice a pattern of just sensational things that they say all the time, understand that there's a bias there and you want to make sure you always get something that's a little bit more neutral so yeah we're struggling as journalists yeah. we, we, need, we need the help we need the support i want to add something to what you said because i know like for me there are journalists or like you know youtube channels or people that i enjoy but what i do is i don't follow them on social media so that i just get the work that's and scary. i'm not like taking in all of them so that i a parasocial relationship is going to happen right but right. at least i'm just taking in their work and I'm not taking it every piece of them. So it kind of mm-hmm. helps me mm-hmm. with my discernment a little more. Mm-hmm. Or like I'm That's able right. to, I'm able to like be like, well, you know, I really appreciate her, her you know, her black feminist politics, but you know, she could be a little classist. You know, like I'm able yeah, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't follow their life or I don't, That's you know. That's something that's been helpful for me. So I think that could be, you know, helpful for the viewer. We could close with that. So thanks for doing this with us. We'll see you in the next video. Remember, you are a bad bitch. You are enough. And yeah, see you in the next one. Ever since I left your crib yesterday Trying to work, but it's hard to concentrate 